Yep. Alrighty. Good morning. How are you all doing today? Good, good. So, before I begin, I would like to just say first thank you to my wife, my beloved, who continues to help me as I uh, continue to learn and grow, and thank you all for coming. And first, I'd like to thank God and what he's done in my life providentially and using a weak man like me to proclaim the gospel. So we will be in Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 through 37. And the title for today's sermon is The Revelation of God to Man Leads to the Repentance of Man. But before I begin, uh, let us start in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today, for today and what you have done. I just ask that you guide me as I speak and that with each word I speak, I glorify you and that we hold these words tight into our hearts and that we continue to be reminded of who you are and that no one can stop or deny you and that you will accomplish your good purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So for those of you who have not been with us, we've been in the book of Daniel. And as we've seen in the book of Daniel, we've seen God's sovereignty throughout the book. In chapter 3, we saw Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezariah get delivered from the fiery furnace. And we have seen Nebuchadnezzar and his wickedness. And from last week, Pastor John had preached on chapter 4, verses 1 through 18, where we really see that King Nebuchadnezzar is a changed man. Nebuchadnezzar was seen as the monarch, as a day, a wicked man. And he goes from almost killing these men and God delivering these men to then glorifying God in chapter 4 in verses 1 through 3. So John had alluded to that this is a changed man, that his heart has changed. And really what we see in chapter 4 is his testimony and how he is converted. We see him praising the Most High, and then in verses 4 through 18, we saw that he had a dream of a great tree that resembled himself and that that tree would be chopped down. And in verses 19 through 27, we see Daniel interpret that dream. And at the end of interpreting that dream, Daniel tells him to repent, tells him to repent. So there's a quick recap, and then we'll start in verse 28, and I will first read the, ver the passage in its entirety, and then I'll go back verse by verse. Okay. All this reached Nebuchadnezzar the king. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king answered and said, Is this not Babylon the great which I myself have built, as a royal house by the strength of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is said, the kingdom has been removed from you, and you will be driven, from, driven away from mankind, and your place of habitation will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you know that the Most High is the powerful ruler over the kingdom of mankind and gives it to whomever he wishes immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was accomplished and he was driven from mankind and began eating grass like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagles feathers and his nails like birds claws but at the end of the days I Nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes toward heaven and my knowledge returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven, and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can strike his hand, or say to him, What have you done? At that time my knowledge returned to me, and, I, and my majesty and splendor returned to me. For the glory of my kingdom, and my high officials and my nobles began seeking me out, so I was reestablished in my kingdom, and extraordinary greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor 
the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. So again, we see his conversion. And in verses 29 through 30, we see arrogance. In verses 31 through 33, we see accountability. In verses 34 through 37, we see acknowledgement. So this really parallels conversion for all of those who call on the name of the Lord. They have been converted, have saving faith. And what we really see is God reveal himself, and it leads Nebuchadnezzar to repentance, to repentance. In verse 28, all this reached Nebuchadnezzar the king. This, all of this, the dream, verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. 12 months had passed, 12 months. At first, when he had this dream, he was afraid and alarmed. And now he's probably at ease doing what he usually does um, in pride. And really what we really see here is God's patience. We see 12 months had passed, and God gives him time to repent. God warns him, and as we see, he has not repented yet. He's not repented yet. Verse 30, the king answered and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal house by the strength of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Again, we see arrogance. And whether we'd like to admit it or not, prior to conversion, we were in this same position, making statements like, I won because of my abilities. I got, I got through it because I'm tough and I don't need any help. Or even maybe I don't need saving, I'm a good person. We were all in arrogance whether we would like to admit it or not. And really, we see this in Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. So if you don't mind, if you could go to that real quick. Okay, and so I'll, I'll read here. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God, and all have turned aside, and together they have become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. With these verses, we really see arrogance, uh, especially in verse 11. There is none who seeks for God. And at the end, in verse 18, there is no fear of God. Prior to conversion, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and we see not a need for God. We don't see a need, and we don't fear him. Right? Just And we see this is where Nebuchadnezzar is at right now. He's on, he's the king, and he's uh, probably has his hands in the air, saying that this is what I did. I did this. Well, we know that he's about to get humiliated here. Okay? In verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is said, the kingdom has been removed from you. God doesn't even let him finish his sentence. Hands in the air. I did it. I did it because of my power, my strength, and the words don't even leave his mouth. He was warned, and God reveals himself there and shows him that the kingdom has been removed from you now. I gave you time to repent, and you did not. You did not. Verse 32. And you will be driven away from mankind, and your place of habitation will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you know that the Most High is the powerful ruler over the kingdom of mankind and gives it to him ever he wishes. Whatever he wishes. Really what we see is God's sovereignty and what I, what I mean by that, I think Jay Bridges has a phenomenal definition, very simple. The sovereignty of God means that he is in absolute control of every event and circumstance. Every event and circumstance. And what we really see here is God reveals himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar comes to the reality that he is now being held accountable for what he's done. And when God's revealed himself 
we were in arrogance, and then we then see that we are accountable for what we've done. Obviously, we know for those who have been converted, then turn and repent to Christ. But here we do see that he then now sees that he is being held accountable for what he's done. And we really see this in Romans 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both internal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. God has revealed himself, created the heavens and the earth, and he has shown that he is the creator and that we are accountable for giving him praise. And as we see in the sacred scriptures, he's revealed himself. And this revelation then has led us, the call to repentance, to him. Verse 33. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was accomplished. He was driven away from mankind and it began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. Immediately, at that very moment, it happened. At that very moment. And again, we really see God's sovereignty in punishing him and humiliating him, humbling him for what he has done. And for the secular, secular world, when they look at this, they see boanthropy, which is a delusion in which a person believes himself or herself to be a bovine. But really what we know is that he was humiliated. God in his power and sovereignty had declared this to happen to him, and he was warned and didn't repent. And here is another quote just regarding uh, this verse from uh, Matthew Henry. Let us learn how to value our reason and to pity the case of those that are under the prevailing power of sadness or distraction or delirious, and to be very tender in our judgments of them and conduct towards them for it is a trial common to men in a case which sometime or other may be our own. Maybe our own. I thought that was great wisdom from Matthew Henry regarding this verse. Okay. Verse 34. So again, we see verses 29 through 30, we see arrogance. In verses 31 through 33, we see accountability. We see that he's accountable for what he's done. And then here we're going to get into acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. Verse 34. But at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes toward heaven. Can you imagine that? He's probably, he was probably on all his fours, and he was on his fours for seven years. It's not just seven months, seven days, seven years. He was like this. And now, at the end of that appointed time, he lifted up his eyes toward heaven. And my knowledge returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. And we really see a, a parallel in Psalms 123, 1 through 2, the prayer for the Lord's help. To you I lift up my eyes, the one enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a servant girl to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to Yahweh our God. And here we see that he says, my knowledge returned to me. And really we see, again, another parallel when it comes to conversion in Luke 15, 17 through 18 in the parable of the prodigal son, a story about repentance. And here's the verses. But when he came to himself, there's that concept of his knowledge returning to me. He said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will, I will rise up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Again, what we see here is his knowledge returns to him, which is through the grace of God. Our faith is through the, God's grace. And God and his grace enables him to have his knowledge return to him. And we really see repentance here. And he says, I blessed the Most High, praised and honored him who lives forever. He didn't just praise him. He didn't just honor him. He didn't just bless him. He blessed, praised, and honored him with all of his might. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures 
from generation to generation. He's, we see his everlasting kingdom here. And verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. Okay, what we see here is a parallel in Isaiah 40, 17, with the greatness of God. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as non-existent, utterly formless. Utterly formless. And this next line, but he does according to his will in the hosts of heaven. We see more parallels in the book of Isaiah uh, when Yahweh's judgment on, it, on uh, Syria. For Yahweh of hosts has counseled, and who can throw out it? As for his stretched hand, stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Another parallel in Job 42.2 and Job's confession and repentance. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. thwarted. Another parallel in Proverbs 21.30. There is no wisdom, there is no discernment, and there is no counsel, no counsel against Yahweh. We see these parallels in these lines what he does according to his will and the host of heaven among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can strike against his hand. And we see even another parable at the end of verse 35, and in, in, say to him, what, you, what have you done? We see a parallel in Romans 19 through 20, in God's sovereign choice. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Will the things molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Romans 11, 33-34 in the mystery of Israel's salvation. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? And, or who, who became his counselor? And what we really see here is Nebuchadnezzar went from, in the beginning of this passage, he went from being on his temple. And Nebuchadnezzar was even known to create one of the seven wonders of the world in the ancient world, uh, the Hanging Garden. And he was, I couldn't imagine how high his building probably was, of him looking and really just being arrogant. And then he goes from that, then at the end of this, he goes from being on all fours for seven years. For seven years. And we see then he comes to repentance. And God revealing himself and his power and his sovereignty that turns, that makes Nebuchadnezzar turn towards him. And that he even had these things or even can have breath because of the Most High. Because of the Most High. Verse 36. At that time, my knowledge returned to me. And my majesty and splendor returned to me. For the glory of my kingdom, my high officials and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my kingdom, and extraordinary greatness was added to me. What we really see is Nebuchadnezzar is given back his kingdom. We see in his dream that there was a stump that remained, and he was given back uh, what, he, what he had. God didn't have to do that, but he did. He did. And again, and what we really see is, but we do see a change now. He's given back this kingdom, but now he understands who the Most High is and that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, that God is who gave it to him. So there, though he has his kingdom back, there's a, he's a changed man from where he was at the end of chapter 3 to now in giving his testimony. And in verse 37, now I... Nebuchadnezzar, praise, extol, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Again, he doesn't just praise or honor the king of heaven. He prays, extol, and honors the king of heaven. And for all his works are true. All his works are true. We see a parallel in Deuteronomy 32, 4 in the Song of Moses. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness, without injustice, righteous and upright he is. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? And the second part, his ways are just. We see two parallels, and actually in the book of Revelation, 
in, the, in uh, chapter 16, the seven bowls of God's wrath, verse 7, and I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. In Revelation 19, 1 through 2, the multitude rejoicing in heaven. And they say this, and after these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great crowd in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. His judgments are true and righteous. And this last part, he's able to humble those who walk in pride. As we see, he's able to humble. Uh, he's definitely humbled us. And when he's revealed himself, we were in arrogance. And then now we see that we're accountable. And we really see that we need a savior. That is why, for those of you who are converted, that's why you've repented and turned to Christ. Because God has revealed himself and shown you who you really are apart from him. That you are nothing. And here is a uh, quote from Albert Barnes, I think is quite good. And it says, what had occurred to Nebuchadnezzar might occur to others. And as God had shown that he could reduce the most exalted sovereign of the earth to the lowest condition in which a human being can be, he inferred that he could do this same to all and that there was no one so exalted in rank so vigorous in health and so might in intellect that he could not effectually humble and subdue him. And really what we see is we don't really see Nebuchadnezzar anymore after this point. It was known that he lived for about a year longer, but we know he dies a changed man. He dies a changed man purely out of God's sovereign grace. He becomes a new man. And so again, what we see is a parallel to our conversion, how we were once in arrogance like King Nebuchadnezzar prior to knowing Christ and that through God and him revealing himself to man, we see that we're accountable for what we've done. And then and through God's revelation and him revealing himself and through the scriptures, we then see that we turn and repent to him and lift our eyes toward heaven, toward him. I don't know where some of you are today. I am not God. I do not know your guys' hearts, whether how many times you've been here or not. I don't know. But all I can say is this. For those of you who do not know Christ, I urge you to repent of your sins and to turn to him. From He has accomplished salvation for all those who believe in him. He died the most gruesome death on the cross, the most gruesome death taking on God's wrath. And that we can look in the scriptures and know that there was one sacrifice for all, and it was Christ. It was Christ. And again, I just urge you that you look to Christ and repent and see him in all his glory. Because when you put them both on the scale, when you put Christ in everything that this world has to offer, Christ is far more worth than the last. Far more worth. And that you can have assurance in him and that he's accomplished it. And that he's accomplished it. So again, I just ask that um, you continue to look inside your hearts and be reminded of how God can work in people's lives and how he's humiliated and humbled Nebuchadnezzar to repent and that he can do that to any man, any man or woman. It's purely out of his sovereign grace. So as I close out, I'll close out in prayer. And then for any of those who would like to talk about the gospel and talk about our Lord Jesus Christ or who do not know him, I'll be here, and so you can just come up, or if anyone needs to pray, you guys all can pray, okay? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and all you've done and what you have accomplished. And as we've seen in the scriptures, we were once arrogant before you, and that through you and revealing yourself, we see that we're held accountable for what we've done, and that through your revelation, we see grace and mercy, for we have then repented and turned to you, and that we lift our eyes toward heaven just as he did, just as he did know that we can have relationship with you and that be with you for eternity. And for those of are here that do not know Christ, I just ask that if it be your will, that they come to that knowledge and understanding. And all these things, we praise and exalt you. In Jesus' name, amen.